Welcome and thank you so much for joining us for this Alumni Hour event. My name is Ange Lavoie-Pierre. I'm a journalist and presenter at the ABC and I've been hosting this series where we meet some of the Faculty of Medicine, Dentistry and Health Sciences most extraordinary alumni. First, I'd like to acknowledge and pay my respects to the Gadigal people, the traditional owners whose land I'm on today. I'd also like to pay respect to the traditional owners of the many lands we're all on to their elders, past, present and emerging. Today, we are talking to medical doctor and University of Melbourne PhD alum, Associate Professor Tom Oxley. And we've already had some great questions come through in advance that we will hope to get to, but if you do have questions throughout the session, please enter them into the Q&A uh, and we'll try to get to those as well at the end. Uh, Tom is a vascular and interventional neurologist and a world expert in brain computer interfaces. He is the founding CEO of Synchron, and we'll explain more about that soon. He is the Director of Innovation Strategy in the Department of Neurosurgery at Mount Sinai Hospital in New York. And he was a key figure in establishing the Vascular Bionics Laboratory at the University of Melbourne, which he currently co-leads with Associate Professor Nick Opie. Tom Oxley, welcome. Thank you for making the time to join us. Um, Most welcome. To say from the outset, uh, that, that your work is fascinating doesn't quite touch the sides. The language that I've heard you use for it in the past is uh, telepathy, that it, it's sort of conceptually a stone's throw from telepathy. And we'll get into all of that in just a moment. But uh, firstly, I, I suppose we have a pretty extraordinary range of people who are watching this talk today, everyone from experts, uh, you know, experts in their field, medical experts, through to students in science and engineering. Um, so a Good place to start is by asking you, what is an interventional neurologist? Uh, well, so a neurologist is a physician that treats brain disease and disorders. An interventional neurologist relates to a particular subspecialty, which is procedural. And the procedure is called an interventional procedure. So intervention is uh, that which involves coming into the body into a blood vessel, either an artery or a vein, usually in the groin, in the leg, sometimes in the arm, sometimes in the neck. And then you get, you get into the blood vessels and you make your way into organs that your, that your field is. And in, in our case, it's in the head and the neck and the brain, and you can treat particular conditions. So an interventional neurologist, uh, the bread and butter is, is coiling aneurysms, cerebral aneurysms. Uh, most recently, uh, probably the largest, um, uh, I would say, breakthrough in, in stroke treatment occurred a couple of years ago is the ability to pull out a blood clot that causes a stroke. That's now become probably the most um, common procedure in this space. And then there's a bunch of other areas. So my, my the technology we're developing is um, its its origin was through thinking about what you could achieve through using blood vessels as the entry port into the brain because you don't have to do you don't have to cut the skull to get in there you come up through the base of the skull um, and we've we've taken intervention and then we've built onto that electrophysiology which is the interaction of nerves through sensing and stimulating yeah we've got we've leapt a couple of steps ahead there so i'm going to revisit all that in detail but um firstly i i suppose i wanted to ask what drew you into this area? How did you come to be in the field you are now? So I, um, I went into medicine I, uh, initially just from a fascination of the, with the brain itself, with how that uh, organ could create consciousness. Um, I started in psychiatry actually, and then I moved into neurology. And then I think it was around 2007, I was starting to hear about this technique of pulling out blood clots that caused stroke and I think it seemed obvious to me back then that interventional neurology was going to uh, become a mainstay of, of medicine in the same way it happened in interventional cardiology and typically uh, the neurologists are about 20 years behind the cardiologists with uh, breakthrough technologies and so it was you know there, there was a whole lot of precedence there with cardiology to set the scene with what could happen um, with interventional neurology. And I think that's what we're seeing this decade. Okay, so after you completed your medical degree in the first place, you took a break and you went traveling and most people would have been 
heading for the beach, I suppose, at that point, that would have been the priority. But instead, you ended up pitching the head of neurology at the US Army, <laughs> which I have so many questions about. Um, I'll need you to tell us how that happened. Actually, we, I did head to the beach that year as well, but I took a, <laughs> I took a year off. A lot of medical students take a year off um, somewhere, like either Australian anyway, after, after school, maybe in the middle of med school, I hadn't. And I went straight through, I did my um, internal medicine training or like what's called basic physician training, BPT. I passed the exam and had gone through a bad breakup and just decided needed a, needed a bit of a break. And so I went traveling for a year. I went like, I went mostly on my own to Africa and the Middle East and um, I think some parts of Asia, 35 countries. But at the end of the year, I was thinking a lot that year about what I wanted to do. And so I ended up in the US and it was a pretty open book. And at the very beginning of that US trip, I had a meeting with this um, Colonel Jeffrey Ling. And then that, that, that the trip then took a turn into an academic turn because um, an opportunity arose from that meeting. I, I have to ask how you kind of, uh, you know, because I think for a lot of people, it's not natural to kind of have the um, confidence or, or the front you know, forward thinkingness to, to, for want of a better term, to go and put yourself in that position. How did, how did that come to be? Were you, did you kind of cold call them or, or how does it happen? So just before I tell you about, it was a cold call, but just laying up to that point, I think the exposure I'd had was three things. Firstly, academically um, in 2008, reading a paper published by Lee Hochberg, which was the first brain computer interface trial in a human by the BrainGate team, which was a breakthrough um, I saw that paper came out, come out. I thought that that was going to be representative of a um, frontier technology that was going to offer a solution for uh, conditions that were not currently treatable. So that struck me as an incredible space to be moving into. The second thing was that I had some understanding of motor cortical electrophysiology from an honors in the, in the middle of medical school. I took a year off to do a bachelor of medical science um, which is still offered in the University of Melbourne medical program um, while I was at Monash. Uh, and I did that in transcranial magnetic stimulation. So that gave me some exposure to motor cortical electrophysiology. And then the third thing was that I was um, becoming very interested in interventional neurology. And so it was a combination of the electrophysiology and the interest in this emerging interventional field. Then so I think what I did, so those things were percolating um, in my head and I was, I knew I wanted to do a PhD and I didn't know what in, but uh, I had, you know, the idea of these particular interests. And then on that trip, I think I, I, I think I shot out that heading out to the US, I think I shot out something like a hundred cold call emails to various people. And it was not particularly with, it was pretty opportunistic. I was just, it was a shotgun approach to a whole range of people who were doing cool stuff. And I thought I'd love to talk to them and ask them about where I should go, what I should do. And Jeffrey Ling, you know, only about 10% of people would write back to, to me. So I only got like heard back from a, a fraction of those emails. Colonel Jeffrey Ling was one of them, which was remarkable given uh, who this guy is. And it was just, it was reflective of him as a person. Um, but he was willing just to meet me completely out of the blue. So I went to Walter Reed Army Institute, I walked into the, you know, the US defense area, sat down with him and just uh, told him I was interested. And then at the end of the, we had a broad conversation. And then I said, hey, can I tell you about this idea about, you know, you're funding research in the US defense with, put, you know, taking off the skull and putting in electrodes. Why don't you use the blood vessels to go up into the brain and do it? And he just said, oh, that's an interesting idea. Um, yeah, we'd probably, we'd probably give you a million dollars if you put together a decent team for that. And so then the, the story goes on, but then I had to come back in three weeks to meet with another US defense DARPA program manager called Jack Judy. And in that three weeks, I realized I couldn't, I had to figure out what I was kind of, what this idea was. And so I then spent the next three weeks going around the US um, asking to, you know, meet lab Elite top academics at Ivy League universities around the US who were doing work in this space and very quickly get up to speed with what was happening latest in the field. So, um, yeah. Oh, I was just going to say, it sounds like the kind of opening 10 minutes of a, like Ocean's Eleven film or something. Like, so you're kind of like 
pinging around the US talking to this kind of all the all these incredible people in this field was that what what is, is that part of the process for then um, doing the research that you needed to do in developing what became the Stentrode? Yeah, it, it was the origin story. And so and so I came back, met Jack Judy, I presented to him, I put together this horrible presentation about all this stuff that I barely understood, scratched the surface of like really complicated things like carbon nanotubes and bioabsorbable polymers and uh, spectral um, decoding that I didn't understand, a whole bunch of stuff I didn't understand. And I came back to him and I presented this bold presentation and I said, give us, give us a million dollars and in three years we'll deliver all this. And he just like, he, he had these two offsiders there and he like, we got to the end of the presentation and he like, he looks at me and he like says at the end, you have no idea what you're talking about, do you? <laughs> and I was like, oh man, I'm caught out. And so I like sat back in my chair, smiled, laughed and said, no, no idea. We're just like giving it a nudge. And he's like, he's like, well, you know, I, I respect that. And so if you can go home to Melbourne and put together a decent team, we'll consider funding you. And then, so I came back to Melbourne, start, started my neurology residency and had this dangling opportunity and then was able over the next nine months to put together a team at the University of Melbourne, primarily with the help of Professor Terry O'Brien, David Graydon and Anthony Burkett, and Clive May at the Flurry. And with that team, we got the grant. And so I enrolled in a PhD and we had our first million dollars and I met uh, Nick Opie. And Nick helped write the grant. So Nick and I won the grant and then Nick and I started um, developing this together. And Nick, Nick was basically making the devices by hand at the beginning. So you were, in your own words, kind of giving it a nudge in no, by no stretch of the imagination, an expert in this field or a leading expert in this field at this point. Um, did you kind of think at, at any point in these early days Oh, what have I gotten myself into? Can I really pull this off? Or were you just excited? Um, I, me and Nick and PDU looked back at this uh, about not too long ago, and we we went we went back and looked at that first presentation. And if I knew what I know now, you hear this all the time. But if I knew what I know now, I would have like never have like I would have known that I was talking such crap and that I you know. <laughs> I didn't, it wasn't, it wasn't malicious. It wasn't like uh, misleading. I was just being completely fanciful and, and dreamy about what maybe could happen. And that was what he actually bought into. And so, you know, if, if someone has a new idea or something exciting that you want to pursue, it's very easy to very quickly find the reasons why it might not work. And people think that if you can, if you very quickly find a reason why it might not work, that's enough to pull out all your enthusiasm from pursuing it. But you don't know what people are going to value and you don't know, you know, you don't know what you're going to move into and you don't know how it's going to grow. And blind enthusiasm and blind faith and energy and doggedness is just as, if not more important than, you know, um, having a clear cut hypothesis that's got everything answered. Like you've just you've got to throw yourself in there and, and see how, where it can go. And I've got to say from the very beginning, like I had, su it was such a, such an, the way it emerged was so opportunistic and so like, you know, on a whim, mm. although the thing had been percolating, but the way it turned out is like we had nothing to lose. And so, no, I didn't have a sense of responsibility. We were like just giving it a shot and seeing where it would go with no expectation that it would go anywhere with that mentality. And only over after year after year after year after year does the the responsibility start to rise as you're now you know raising more and more money to make this a reality. And but that's that that was the mindset with how it all started. All right, let's talk more specifically about the technology because it is extraordinary. Just explain like where five. Um, what is it? How does it work? Yeah, start from the top. Yeah. So there are different parts of our brain that, that serve different roles and they're pretty well defined actually, even though we don't fully understand how they all intermix with one another that easily. There's a part of your brain that does memory. There's a part of your brain that does sight. There's a part of your brain that does sensation. And there's a part of your brain that controls movement. And so what is movement? Movement is the direct control over all the individual muscles in your body, um, which is under volitional control. So a critical part of movement is um, volition or the intention to move. 
And so the idea with a brain computer interface is that you can put an electrode or a sensor into that part of the brain called the motor cortex, which is the control center of the brain. And when the, the person, the user, the patient intends to move a part of their body and the sensor can see that, then it doesn't matter if the signal comes out of the body or not because you've recorded the intention up here. And then if you can bring that signal out, you can turn that into a control signal that is, digi that is digitized, which can therefore be used to control anything digital. And so for people who have lost their ability to transmit their motor signals out of their brain into the body, so spinal stroke, spinal cord injury, muscle disease, uh, motor neuron disease, there's you know, 19 conditions we've identified that uh, are in that category. Then, and they have a, they, and that condition has caused an inability to interact physically with the world. Any control of a digital device that can restore independence or restore function, that could become a useful use of that signal. So you have to get the device in safely. It's got to record from the brain. It's got to last over a long time. And it's got to be interchange. It's got to be usable with a system that actually makes a difference for your life. Yeah, and and so it is. You know, a little dramatic in some ways, but I can see how the telepathy comparison applies here. Yeah. So the telepathy was a little bit. We intentionally, I intentionally decided to use that term in that TED TED talk to create a little bit. You know, I wouldn't didn't want to be too contentious, but um, it was a little bit you know, um, intended to evoke like uh, a discussion. And so telepathy is, you know, the, uh, I think the capacity to communicate um, with invisible means basically. So yeah, I think the, the first protocol for people who are paralyzed is that the restoration of communication is always the number one item if that's gone. So in terms of, in terms of um, fu independent functioning, communication is the number one goal. So that's where we have started our journey. Um, you've just completed your first uh, inhuman implantations. How's it gone? Um, so it's been a long journey. It's been years of discussion with the ethics committee at Royal Melbourne Hospital, years of discussion with the FDA about what's going to be safe. And we've done a whole bunch of um, benchtop testing, animal testing. And the first first thing to say about the first, first in human trial is that it's primarily a safety study and where where it's so far fingers crossed touch wood it's been perfect so the issues that we were concerned about and to put it to put it kind of bluntly um and this was the same issue back in the 70s that people were very concerned about with cardiac pacemakers they were first saying you can't leave a lead sitting in a vein inside the heart that's crazy it's going to blood clot it's going to cause problems and there were some blood clots initially, but now pacemakers are one of the you know, most understood technologies. And it's very similar to what we're doing. A lead inside a vein, inside the heart. We're leaving a lead inside the brain, inside a vein, inside the brain. And the same, we've had the same concern over safety. You can't leave a vein in the, a lead in the head. It's going to blood clot. So we've worked very hard to build a system that won't blood clot. And so this trial uh, was focused on safety primarily. You said, uh, do you have any idea about efficacy yet as well? Yeah, so we we did decide to publish our first couple of patients um, before the first five patients were done. So that the first five patients was meant to be the embodiment of the first study. So we actually, the reason we decided to, to publish was because we were beginning to see some outputs that were suggestive of good efficacy. Um, we actually got some pushback from the journal saying you can't make any safety claims yet. It's too early. You have to do a whole five patients. Mm. But in, so we didn't. So we didn't make any safety claims. But so far, so good. Um, but we did see some signal to suggest that the system is useful for um, our first couple of patients. So yes, we're we're um, we're very excited that we've been able to uh, have the patients using the system to control multiple outputs to control their computer in a way which has been beneficial for them. And just to kind of break that down, when you say control that computer, what kind of functions, things are they able to do now that they wouldn't have been able to do before? What are, what are the kind of tactile improvements for those people? Yeah. Uh, so the, 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 the first two patients we've had still had movement in their eyes. They both had motor neuron disease, but their eyes were still working. So there's a technology already called eye tracking or eye gaze, which is actually now um, uh, being sold like um, 
with Windows, with the new Windows 10. It's like part of the package. The problem with eye tracking, and it's great because it, it allows you to move the cursor around the screen. It just watches your eyes. But if you want to click something or input, insert a command, it's not very good at that. Um, and to do it, you have to like lock your eye in one little spot, little timer appears, takes about a second. And if you move your eye or if you blink or if you lose it, it won't do it properly. Or sometimes if you set it too quick, it'll click accidentally. So we, we said, let's, let's, let's leave the eye tracking and then give multiple commands to the patients so that they can um, in increase their speed and reduce their error rate with the use of the system. And so the first two, so we've had three commands coming out for the patient, but the first two commands um, have been have, have generated such a high level of functioning for the patients that we decided to publish it. And it was left click and zoom. And so they're able to look around the screen. They only click when they want to click because they're in, it's under volition. If they choose an area of the screen, they can expand it, it zooms up, and then they, then they put another command in and they can click. So the combination of the eye tracking, the zoom and the left click has given them excellent, elegant, um, simple, and non-fatiguing control over the system. And so that's that's what we published. I have a question about the nature of volition because thinking about this, you know, you, you, you would wonder if some of the commands that you give your body via your brain are somewhat involuntary or, or if there's a way that you could be kind yeah. of, or, or is volition the way that the your technology is set up to interpret it? Um, is it looking for something very uh, concerted and directed from, from the individual? Yeah. So volition's really interesting and it's, it's a complicated um, network within the brain that um, enables volition because you have, you can have volition in a whole range of different domains in your brain. And we're talking about motor volition. And so what we realized was if we can isolate the motor volition to individual ind independent muscle groups in the body, right hand, left hand, right knee, left knee, ankle, you know, it goes on. If we can isolate motor volition to those little groups, then we can give command functions that are very easily reproducible for the patients. So squeeze your right hand gives like a control tab or a left click or a enter or a mouse click or a zoom. We can assign different outputs to various different parts of the body. The patient's not using those parts of the body anymore because the body's not moving, but the brain is still able to generate that independent signal and our machine learning algorithm can identify or classify the way the brain sends up those independent signals. So, right. So the command, the volition command, is not click. It's um, you know tap your right index finger or something like that. Right. Yeah. But think about like a PlayStation controller or a video game controller. Like when you first sit down to play a game, you're kind of looking at the button that you're mm. clicking, and you're like, oh, thinking about clicking that button. After a couple of games, your brain gets used to it and you're no longer thinking about it, you're now thinking about jump or fire or whatever it's doing in the game because of plasticity. Yeah. And it's the same, same with our system is that at the beginning they train, they have to figure it out and then it becomes like second nature. They are actually eventually thinking about clicking, no longer thinking about their hand. That's where it gets really interesting because uh, you know, it, it speaks to the psychology of it, which is you know we're born with this part of the brain controlling a set of muscles or limbs in our body that are attached to us. You can't interchange them, but now you've got a digital interchangeable actuator that can be shifting in its embodiment of what it is. So psychologically, it's, it's pretty interesting about what that means. Yeah, very. Um, and you mentioned uh, some of the uh, conditions that the technology as it currently exists um, you, you imagine it'll help in something like 19, I think you said. Um, what, are, what kind of expansion of that list do you expect? What are, what are the kinds of future medical applications for this technology that you imagine? Yeah. So we've grouped them. We've grouped the conditions into various things. So there are conditions that are due to trauma. So injury, spinal cord injury, um, nerve injury, amputation. There are condi that, so that's loss of limb control. There are conditions um, that are due to uh, immune-mediated immune mediated conditions like demyelination, so multiple sclerosis. There are other conditions that cause um, wasting over time of the nerves. Um, tumors, um, stroke, uh, anything where there's an inability to control the body, but the brain is still working um, is going to be potentially um, treatable, well, partially treatable with this technology. 
Okay, so so I feel like I, I feel like I would be remiss if I didn't ask about the non medical applications for this technology as well. And I'm and I'm I'm asking you to kind of. Uh, maybe look quite a way into the future here. And, and I don't know if this is something you're prepared to do, but it, you know, the mind kind of boggles at the possibilities. Yeah. Um, Elon Musk does a great job of speaking about that kind of a world where this technology is what saves us from the uh, robot overlords. I'm kind of hard. I find it hard to talk about, you know, we're talking about 20 to 30 to 40 years in the future. Um, there's plenty of dystopian, uh, science fiction representation to where the technology goes. I'm watching a show at the moment called The Feed, which is terrifying and actually looks like a very similar technology to what we we're building and it didn't, it didn't go, it didn't end well. Yeah. So, you know, I think, I think the first thing to say is that ethically speaking and, you know, what we're setting out to do is oh. we're setting out to, you know, I think as with any new technology, you can begin to project into the future with what bad applications or bad uses could potentially be. You could have done the same with the automobile, with the car, you know, um, how much how much injury and death and horribleness has been f occurred from that or other weapons. Um, what we're doing is trying to solve a unmet need for people who are disabled. And that that's kind of all our focus is. So with that aside, and if I'm gonna dream a little bit about where it's going, I think if we presume that the technology becomes miniaturized, that it's extremely safe, um, that you've pretty much removed the risk side of it and there's only upside. At that point, I think there could be a demand for this technology in um, uh, uh, working conditions where superior technology interaction is needed. And so these aren't things that I've thought of, but people have come to me and said that they could see a future way out, you know, um, like with, uh, for instance, um, astronauts or uh, where there's a need for interaction with technology that is that is beyond what the human body can do. Um, you know, I, I can see that possibly um, being a future, but it's, uh, you know, it's hard to imagine. I think it's a long, long way away. I can just sense in, in what you're saying that there's, a, you, you obviously have a real frustration with kind of unwittingly have been placed in the camp of the Elon Musks of the world <laughs> so far. How do you kind of, I mean, I guess you just kind of have to distance yourself from that. Uh, I mean, to be honest, I think it's, I think it's awesome. I think he's a, you know, a, a generational genius who's, who's making huge impacts in multiple industries. And there's no reason why he shouldn't do it in the medical industry as well. And he talks about things very fancifully. And then the reality is it turns out to be something far more practical. So mm -hmm. I've no doubt that he is probably going to generate something incredible. And I think for our space, it's awesome that he's come in because it's generated so much attention on the space, particularly in Silicon Valley and what the investors are looking at now. Um, so overall, I think it's, I think it's awesome that he's, that he's um, trying to make an impact in that side, in that space. Um you mentioned that it was a pretty uh, robust process in terms of assessing the ethics of what it is you're doing here. What were some of the ethical concerns? What were the hurdles you had to clear? Uh, I don't know if they're ethical concerns. Um, they're primarily safety concerns, I would say. I think the ethical, the ethical comes with the, I think, what what the role of the regulatory bodies are in ensuring the technology is rolled out in a safe way and that, and that patients are protected. So from that perspective, from a safety perspective, the FDA, working with the FDA has been pretty uh, amazing. Like that, I think everyone takes the FDA for granted and that they're, they're just there in this sort of behemoth regulatory body. But the way, watching them deal with this very new space, brain computer interfaces and roll out a conceptual framework for how to deal with risk and safety. It's been awesome over the last couple of years and given us a um, avenue on how to go about assessing safety. So I don't know, on the ethical side, it's a bit more, it, it's, it's, I think, I think the questions, I think the ethical questions will come when and if the technology is um, starting to be used in ways that it wasn't meant to be intended or if it you know, was beyond what, um, you know, beyond the use case that's been approved from the FDA. And I think, I think we're decades away from that, to be honest. 
Do you, do, do you think about it at all, though? I mean, granted, you're decades away from it. The technology is decades away from it, I should say. And your application is very much, uh, you know, has a focus on helping people living with a disability. Um, but do you turn your mind to those bigger picture ethical concerns that you imagine coming into play in the future? Um, I, only when I'm speaking to my best mate back in Melbourne, who's constantly telling me that it's the start of the end. <laughs> um, so yeah, I mean, I have, I have lots of, you know, I, I think I'm around people and, you know, our group as well, we talk about it a lot. Um, I think it doesn't really impact what we're doing right now because all we're doing right now is trying to help people who have paralysis. And so the other, the other broader questions about what is going to happen out in the future are very hard and not really uh, what we're doing at all. So it, it doesn't really play into the current, you know, um, process. Indulge me though. What do you say to your best mate? Um, that that it's important to have a moral and ethical framework in uh, and being conscious uh, as a society with how the technology moves forward, but not at the detriment when the technology can be useful to help people. Mm. Um, the other thing I say is that genetic engineering has so far been done extremely well um, in terms of managing all the potential risks. We've still got a lot, a lot to do, but um, all, the, all the academics, the, the business leaders came together and created a, a wonderful framework for how to deal with the risks of genetic engineering from all um, domains. And I think that's, that's something that we can do in this space as well. Uh, thinking back to this meeting that you had um, with a, a, you know, senior U.S. military official, and you, you and you had this pitch, and kind of they gave you the money and just said, "Look, I like your moxie, kid." Like that was the some part of the reasoning for giving that to you. Um, do you think that would have happened in Australia? What are, what are the differences between, uh, yeah. I guess, trying to innovate here and trying to innovate there? Yeah. Uh, no, I, I I don't think it would have happened anywhere else except for the U.S and except for that particular program that was running. So that, that program was under what's called DARPA, um, Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency, D-A-R-P-A, DARPA. DARPA has a massive budget. It's, I don't know, I think it's something huge, like 6% of the US um, defense budget. And it's purely to do white space to figure out a way for the US to be leaders. And so they're willing to take these huge gambles and risks, knowing that only five or 10% of that is going to lead to anything, but it gives them technological superiority. Um, I, I just can't think of any program in Australia, let alone in Europe, that would support that kind of um, risk taking. Mm -hmm. Investors certainly wouldn't. I mean, I was trying to raise so after we got the first several million we then had to go and raise more from investors and I spoke to a lot of people in Australia and I could not raise money early on in Australia um, and I had to it was only after I moved to the US and I met a bunch of investors who understood the neurovascular side and who were willing to take a risk on what was a pretty early concept um, I, I just couldn't raise the money in, in Australia but I could do it in, in Silicon Valley how much of that do you think is, how much of that gap between the US and Australia do you think is cultural and how much of it is to do with just there being a great deal more money sloshing around in the US? Yeah, that's, that's a really great question. Um, uh, how much of it's cultural? Uh, certainly the scale of economies is a, is a huge factor. We just, if, if, if there's less money around, there's less uh, willingness to take risks because you don't have as much of a, you know, yeah. And so certainly I've, I've noticed that with the investors in Australia, they're far more, um, they're, they're not as willing to take as many risks and they really want to choose the ones that they're going to have wins in. Whereas over in Silicon Valley, and it's probably less now in Silicon Valley, China is now doing it more than anyone willing to take those risks. That's where true innovation happens, where there's, um, you can see that there are so many reasons why it might fail, but you grab onto one thing, one upside, and you say, "Yep, bugger it, I'm gonna, I'm gonna go with that and see where it goes because I can see a pathway." Moonshot. Money. How much of it's, yeah, but the cultural bit's really interesting. I mean, I think, I think, 
I think tall poppy syndrome still is kind of a thing. And, and I, you know, not just tall poppy syndrome, but I think the, the focus on the downsides rather than the upsides and, you know, being kind of uh, realistic or true blue or real is like in Australia, like if you, if you're a bit more fanciful and talk, a little bit more crazy, you're more quickly going to be cut down in Australia than you would in the US. I think in the US and particularly on the West Coast and Silicon Valley, there is a tolerance for people who talk a lot of crap. And sometimes you don't know where it's going to go. And most of the time, it's probably not, not going to go anywhere. But there's just like, hmm, you know, don't be so quick to judge because innovation comes in really strange places. And so don't presume to understand. And I do think in Australia and British culture, there's more of a skeptical kind of nah, 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 don't go for it than what you'll find in the US. So short of the advice to, uh, you know, just go to the US and cold call a couple of hundred people, what advice would you give to, I guess, young students, young researchers um, who, who want to move into, you know, these innovative areas um, is there is there advice that you would give them operating even just here in Australia? Mm. Mm. So I think one thing was that you've got to be willing to, um, in terms of the cold calls and those initial chats and initial introductions, you've got to be willing to put yourself out there. You've got to be willing to hear a lot of the time that, you know, don't have time for you or no, what you're saying is crazy or no, that's not going to work, but you've just got to keep throwing yourself out there. I think that would be one thing. Um, I think the other thing is um, in terms of uh, like building networks, like it's, it's really important. If, if you're going to hit on something innovative, there's going to be a couple of people who are going to believe in you. And like 99% of people are going to say that what you're doing is not going to work for some various reason. If you've got a firm belief inside you that this should, like there should be something here you've got to go and find those people who are going to support you. And then you've got to go with that. Mm. Um, and that can be really hard to do. So I think the number one uh, most important what once, and you've got to figure out your vision, like you've got to figure out what you want to do. And that's probably the hardest thing. I'm um, figuring out what you want to do. Although we were very opportunistic with what, with what we did um, is then uh, being tenacious. Like you've got to, you've got to be willing to um, not give up. Thick skin, tenacity, also, I suppose, you know, you're someone whose career really intersects a couple of disciplines. Um, is part of it also being broad-minded and, and, and being thinking pretty laterally about what it is that's even possible? Yeah, I think so. I think, like I was saying, I'm, I'm, a, I'm an optimist and I will often ignore the reasons that I want to ignore, which are kind of staring in your face to suggest it's not going to work because you can be wrong about that. You can actually be wrong. Like if you are confident in your skepticism, that's when you can shoot yourself in the foot unknowingly. So you have to be open-minded enough to question yourself, not question yourself even about the things that you think might work, but question yourself about the things that might not work. And there are things, you know, you don't understand how it all comes together yet. And if you just keep, and you know, this is one thing I would say about, um, pursuing an innovation or being an entrepreneur is the successful entrepreneurs, they look back and the pathway that they took was never what they had intended. And so if you tell someone you've got this idea and you're like, Hey, what do you think about this idea? And someone's like, ah, oh, nah, not going to work because of A, B and C. If you were to follow that concept or that idea, actually you're probably going to get to a point and then take a bend and then start going in a different direction. But it's that continued dedication, if you've got a long-term goal, to be willing to take deviations and find a way forward. That's how, the, that's how people meet success. So, yeah. You're based in New York uh, at Mount Sinai Hospital and New York obviously has really borne the brunt of, uh, of, of COVID-19 in the early parts of the pandemic certainly a lot of cases there and it's a long way from over. You guys are heading into winter. Um, what, what do you know from what you've seen there about the neurological impacts of COVID-19? Yeah. So that's, that's a big shift. Um, I'll just say that the, um, I'm in New York. I'm primarily still working on Stentrode technology, but I am still clinically working a, a small amount. So I come in and work in the hospital for a few days every 
few weeks um, taking call and doing procedures. So I have had some exposure to COVID, um, uh, but it's not been primarily what I've seen. But the, the main thing that I, my group at Mount Sinai had um, come to understand was that we were seeing increases in strokes in large vessel occlusion. So blood clots in big arteries like the carotid artery. Um, and that was um, in younger patients was what we were seeing. So um, that's that's probably the, the main one I'd say. But the other interesting one that we're seeing coming up now has, is are these long-term um, chronic fatigue type symptoms associated with COVID that are beginning to emerge now. It's a pretty significant amount, like something like 10% of people are having um, symptoms that continue on for weeks or even months um, with like chronic fatigue and feeling foggy headed and really low in energy and just feeling miserable, um, which is beginning to um, emerge and super interesting. Yeah, and I feel as if um, that's the stuff that is, is often the most frightening to people because they conceive of the illness as one kind of thing. But, you know, as, it, as there's been this dawning realisation about the neurological aspects of the, of the illness, um, it's, if, if anything, really re-incentivised avoidance <laughs> uh, rather than, yeah. oh, I'll just get it and deal with it and then I'll be immune. Well, we don't have that luxury in New York, so we've all had it basically. Yeah. <laughs> not, not quite. Not like in Melbourne. It's been unbelievable how you guys have, and you know, you've got to give credit to the government for maybe uh, having a couple of bumps along the road, but eventually stemming it out. But in New York, it's been like incredible how there was a sense of, well, you know, it's you're probably going to get it and just deal with it. And we saw some horrific, horrific, like when it was in the peak in March and April. Uh, colleagues dying, um, nurses dying, like people we were working with getting sick. So it was just a brutal, brutal approach that um, has been very different to what's happened in Australia. Yeah. And it's a good reminder of that as well. Yeah. It seems as if you've got a long way to run still with the Stentrode. That's going to be the main goal of yours for, for the foreseeable future. But I guess I wondered um, what might be, what, well, what might be next on that front, but you know, if you thought mm. what's next after after this project? Uh, I have, but I haven't put down patents yet, so I'm not sure <laughs> if I can. Uh, no, I, I would broadly say that I'm excited about, um, I think we've learned a lot about implantables and our group has um, figured out a way to do implantables in blood vessels in the brain. But I think over the next 20, 30, 40, 50 years, we look, let's say, what, what are we now, 2020? I think 2070, there's going to be technology that are safe implantables that um, really change the way we interact with the world in a way which hopefully will be positive. And I think um, I'd like to, I think I'm, I'd like to play a role in developing technology like that over the course of, of my, um, but, you know, uh, I think it, it's got to solve problems that are important. It can't be, it can't be uh, done glibly. Is that, is that the filter that you apply to the, the kind of your goals, your aims that you're going, I, I want this to matter in, in that way? Yeah, I think so. I think so. I, I think the other thing that I'm really passionate about, which is what my initial interest in the brain was, and I think which is an area which is, I think we'll look back and say we're in the dark ages about this, is um, subconscious. So the dreaming world, the kind of nighttime world, the subconscious world, that compared to a daytime ego conscious um, existence and the ability to use that to improve the way that we've dealt with our traumas in our life. I think over the course of our lifetime, there's going to be an unlocking of that space that's going to improve the way we live our lives. And I'd love to be able to play a role in doing that. Tom, I have so many more questions for you, but we are out of time. Thank you so much. It's been fascinating uh, and I can't wait to see what you patent next. Thanks, Ange. Thank you. I've got a question here. Does this have any application in controlling involuntary movement, for example, tremors? So there is implantable technology that can treat tremors. That's uh, deep brain stimulation. We, we are looking at whether we can target deep brain structures from blood vessels. Um, it creates a challenge because the electrodes that go into the brain for deep brain stimulation have to be within a millimeter. So you have to find a blood vessel that's coursing around within a millimeter. And we have found a couple, but 
the ability to get to those little tiny vessels with our current um, form is not quite there. So we, we do have some patents on that and would love to, um, there's certainly a lot of interest. And I think one day, can we avoid open brain surgery to achieve deep brain stimulation? Yeah, I think so. Yeah, so a, a lot of it, it sounds like the challenge is to do with the geography of the brain itself and how small you can make the devices. Is that, that's like one of the tension points. And safety, getting it safely leaving things behind in those small little vessels deep in the brain. Okay. Um, this is this is a really interesting one and one that I meant to kind of ask you during the, the Q&A actually, but uh, ran out of time. Could, could this technology have applications to speech to assist patients with aphasia? Um, potentially. Aphasia is um, a mixed bag of, of different insults that, impact the the um, network that, that uh, manifests in speech we're targeting um particular top part of the brain that controls muscles so um we can you can use those muscles to control a mouse or a keyboard that can then generate text that generates speech but if the part of the brain that you need to form ideas into words into language is impacted then our technology in its current form will not help that but um yeah, so I think as long as the speech language, speech center itself in the brain is is preserved, then yes, our technology can help with speech if it's just a, a transmission of muscles problem. Yeah, I guess I mean, that's the core of the question, though, right? Isn't it? It's it's you know you're dealing with motor volition, but does this technology or you know related technology have the capacity to move into interpreting other kinds of volition, or is that kind of often a never never? No, I, th I think it does. I think it's just, it's, it's not what we're looking at now. It certainly has the potential. Um, I, I, the thing about brain computer interfaces is that it makes you think about, you've got, a, you've got a, a sensor or like, think of it like a microphone in a different part of your brain. You have to make that part of the brain activate by thinking about a certain thing and then it will kind of light up. And then if you have control of it, so it then makes you think, well, then how do you activate different parts of the brain? And we know that a little bit from, um, you know, 10 years of, uh, 15 years of research using functional MRI, but really there's still huge parts of the brain we don't fully understand or get how it all works. And until you put a sensor in there, that might be the technology needed for us to fully understand. But that raises a bunch of ethical questions. Right. Yeah. So motor volition is the cleanest path through to, to governing, um, yeah, control. That's exactly, exactly. That's a great way to put it. That's why we're starting. We under... I would say um, there was a surgeon called, I'm going to get his name wrong. I think it was Penf Penfold, Penfold in the 30s who did some critical work in zapping parts of the brain to show how it controls all the muscles that it became the earliest and best understood part of the brain, kind of the dumbest part of the brain. That's why we're starting there. <laughs> Great. Um, got a couple of technical questions now. Does the pulsating blood pressure and blood flow happen inside happening perhaps inside the implanted artery affect stentrode in any way, whether in terms of durability, signal strength, signal noise, et cetera. Um, and if you don't know, then is there a plan to explore this in the future? So we're in the venous system, not arterial. So there is no um, pulsatile flow. It's, it's kind of like a river, not like a pulsing stream. Um, however, we do know that what's really important is if the device, it, it's like a tattoo, it sits on the blood vessel wall and then the cells grow over it. Mm -hmm. And only until the cells grow over it does the um, quality of the recordings get really good. So, and um, blood clots form in the blood vessels when the metal is um, uh, attached, exposed to the blood. And so that's also makes it safer for it to get more incorporated. Um, Penfield. Morikoff is uh, informing me it was Penfielder. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Morikoff, right. the neurosurgeon who came to the mm -hmm. rescue. All right, everyone take note. Um, so <laughs> a very technical question here. I'm not sure um, that it's certainly beyond my sort of generalist knowledge in this area, but do you use corneal sensors for biofeedback on EON generated by com brain computer interface? Oh, wow. I mean, that sounds like an awesome technology. That doesn't exist yet. I would love <laughs> to. Um, I, the answer is no. Okay. Not All yet. right. That's a, a simple answer for a complicated question. Right. Um, this is maybe going over a little bit of the territory that we're talking about before in terms of motor volition being the cleanest path to um, 
to, to govern activity. But the, quest, the questioner says, being fanciful, what applications do you see for implantables in patients with dementia? Mm. Uh, that's a good question. Okay, there is some work at the moment which does stimulation, deep brain stimulation, and they're claiming that that results in an improvement in memory, but I've, I'm pretty dubious over that. Um, ultimately, the big question is, can we put implants in that extend memory, um, kind of like adding RAM to a computer? Um, that's a problem with Alzheimer's. It's actually mainly short-term memory um, that's gone. So can we somehow build a way to add memory? I, I think about that a lot. I, I I can't see how it's going to work, but I kind of have this feeling that within 50 years, we will have figured that out. So yeah, I think an extension of memory is going to be possible somehow once we figured out how to deposit information onto a chip that's inside the brain. It seems like uh, this is going to be a growing area from everything you're saying. Uh, I suppose it's hard not to get that impression after talking to you about all the exciting possibilities in this area, but well, I guess my, my question is one, is this going to be a, a growing area for employment and research in the coming decades? And how should people, young doctors looking to get into this area, approach that? Uh, well, I guess it depends on what you mean by the area. If, if, if it's like neuromodulation, like the, the area, the, the field of implantables, mm. neuroimplantables that um, alleviate um, uh, symptoms of a disease or neuroprosthetics, which is the implantable of devices that um, restore a lost function. That, that's one of the fastest growing areas in, in med tech and medical device technology. So you have to do neurology or neurosurgery if you're a physician, because they're the best fields. And then, um, and then get involved in research that's going, moving that area. Um, but I, I think there's a whole industry, not just for, for physicians, but this whole industry is growing super quick. And like, you know, I think the drug companies are starting to move into it now. They're calling it bioelectronics, which is what device people call neuromodulation. And there's now a huge investment coming in onto the device side. So I think devices have got a hugely bright future. They get smaller, they get more effective, they get localized. Um, um, so yeah, I think, I think medical device technology is a really exciting area to move into and at the university of melbourne i mean you can there's activity in that space in department of medicine uh, faculty of medicine faculty of science faculty of engineering um, it's happening or material science it's happening from all, all around the place um, so you know um join us <laughs> Uh, sounds like a cult, um, <laughs> but an interesting one. Uh, I've got, uh, ju jumping around a bit here, but I've got a very technical question, another one. Um, do you check throm thrombophilia prior to stentrode implantations? No patients with thrombophilia or any clotting disorders or any procoagulant disorders can be recruited into the study. Right. I suppose that would be a question for uh, when you were perhaps, you know, when the, when the stentrode was being used in, a, I don't know, yeah, commercial public sort of way. Yes. So um, the patients who have any issues with formation of blood clots or bleeding uh, it should not have anything left in their blood vessels. Actually, that sort of leads nicely to the next question, which is what is the time frame uh, when when could we expect to see uh, stentroid emerge from the study phase and become more widely available um, perfect with our um, execution which I'm, which I, uh, I'd love to say we will be but it's challenging I would say that um, within three years we've launched our pivotal study in the FDA and within five years it's completed and we've gotten FDA approval to go to market. So hopefully that makes us the first um, brain computer interface implantable to go to market within five years. Um, I don't understand this question, but I'm going to ask it. Have you tried using Echo Loop to interact with your brain, built brain computer interface? I don't know what that is. <laughs> I was hoping you would, because I don't. That's all right. Uh, we have plenty more questions. I, I neglected to ask this in the interview, but I would have liked to. Um, why do you think the US defense was interested in funding this? Um, give that a bad rap. So what happened was, um, and Obama, as he was leaving office, um, put his kind of own brand on this, but 
the U.S. defense before Trump came in was putting huge amounts of money into um, this problem. And the problem that was initially laid out was soldiers, U.S. soldiers were coming home from um, desert warfare, having lost arms and legs from massive explosive injuries. Great body armor, helmet armor. They weren't dying, but they were losing their limbs. And so they built this incredible robotic limb. But then the problem was, well, how do you have the user exert their volitional control over a robotic limb? How do you how do you take control over it? And so the concept was, well, why don't you put a chip in the brain that can then control the robotic limb? Well, that's where it started. And they put hundreds of millions of dollars into this space. But now we've all, I think, taken a step back and realized that robotic limbs are extremely complicated things to control. And there are a whole bunch of smart devices out there that can still make a huge difference for people's lives that don't require such sophisticated levels of control. So we've kind of turned Mac back towards computers that can improve independence. Um, but once you've done that, once you've created that, think of it like an API for the brain or a digital language out of the brain, then presumably you can move towards um, many number of control applications. We have a clarification on the echo loop question. So the echo loop is an Alexa powered smart ring that dishes out reminders and can even function as a speakerphone. Um, and so the question again was, have you tried using echo loop to interact with your built brain computer interface? We're trying to build a um, USB standardized language that kind of in the same way a mouse or a keyboard can interact with any system ours will too so we're, we're, yes is the answer we're creating a very simple um widespread widely adoptable user language for devices to interact with the system all right um, we've got time for one more question and i think it's going to be one that i really liked now where has it got to um alongside brain computer interfaces what other technologies or developments do you foresee as being the most disruptive to medicine in the next 20 years Um, robotics. I think robotics um, is going to be amazing. I think I think uh, people like Morikoff are in big trouble because the robots are going to start to do things better than the humans. And worst part about that is that we're training them by giving them all our data and then they'll take over. Um, <laughs> that's, um, I, I'm I can't think of any others at the moment. I think I think robotics is what I what I'd say is going to be hugely disruptive. All right, that, that's, uh, that's a hot tip. That's where we should invest uh, and that's where everyone should train. I think, I think if anyone's seen um, the show Black Mirror, um, you'll know that uh, human interfaces can create, potentially create carnage. And I think, I think the other big one that Google verily are trying to make is, and someone just, I think, mentioned it already, but the, the corneal lens that gives you a pop-up display without anyone. I think having that, level of um, information all, all the time and recording capability is going to completely change the way that we live our lives and that's going to be a medical device so when you say recording capability do you mean recording sort of what is seen what is perceived or recording the the i guess for what a better term the brain side and you know potentially i guess the applications for dreaming and things like that recording the world as the user sees it and so the inescapability of the recorded truth at every single moment um, and the complete eradication of privacy in our lives is something that's going to be very uh, challenging for, I think, us who in this generation uh, like privacy. Mm. Um, all right. I think we're all sufficiently frightened now. It's a perfectly good place to leave the chat. Tom Oxley, thank you so much for joining us. And uh, as I said, I'll say it again, we can't wait to see what you do next. Thank you.